And good afternoon on this June 24th. I hope uh, I find you and yours well. I'm here uh, in the nation's capital, Ottawa, Ontario. Of course, I'm Ken Brewer, and this is your potluck leadership and coaching segment. And we're going to go to a different lane on the on the highway. And that's just a German Autobahn, and there's a bunch of lanes. We've been in that leadership and coaching lane, but we're going to swerve off to another lane and get into presentations because it's so applicable to so many people now who have been forced to work virtually, connect with their teams. And I thought it was apropos for me to delve into that subject matter. I have some experience, but I'll admit, uh, first and foremost, I know he's listening. When it comes to presenting, my ego gets in the way, which is probably the greatest Achilles for anybody who thinks they can present or wants to present. I am so fortunate to have Anil Delari, the Managing Director for Save It Lake Sally Executive uh, Presentations, uh, Training and Coaching, joining us today to talk about how to manage the new normal when you're presenting to your teams, to your clients, and anybody else within your network. So thank you, Anil Delari, first off, for joining us. I'm really excited to connect with you, brother. Ken, I'm excited about this too, man. I appreciate the opportunity. I always love talking to you. I love the backdrop. You always look sharp. It's all part of the brand and and first impressions mean everything. And obviously, I'm a little more scattered because I have three kids ripping around all over the place and, and uh, I'm trying to juggle all those balls. But uh, great to see you. First off, Save It Like Sully. Uh, I love the name and I remember you launching the company. Now, how long has it been? It's been about 10 years. 10 years since you've launched it. And uh, it had to be an, an epiphany when you said, wait. I've got a company name. Uh, it's kind of obvious, but at the same time, it's worth sharing the story behind it. So go ahead. Well, you know, there's a couple of personal and professional reasons behind the name. Mm -hmm. For, you know, it, it gets everyone's attention. It's such a weird name. And I remember when thinking of a name, like, I got to do something different here. I got to do something that captures people's attention. And I'm thinking of things like Google and Apple and how ridiculous those names are. And ultimately, it was the companies that created the brand, and that was my goal. You can have a, a bit of an off-the-wall off name, but then have a really great service behind it that feeds the brand. So here's my story is on a, on a professional front, uh, I equate a lot of executive presentations with plane crashes. And we all know Sully, the, the great pilot who landed that plane in the Hudson River back in January 2009 movie made after the guy so it's it's kind of around that but it's also a personal story you know my brother-in-law is an air canada pilot flies the exact same airplane in that laguardia all the time so it's a really neat mix of personal and professional reasons why i name it that it's it's a lot more creative and better than the parent company name <laughs> parent company <laughs> name is uh not so creatively uh anil delari consulting inc Right. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. yeah. Very but, straightforward. So you come up with this great name for a company, uh, but now the company itself, uh, you were, uh, I, I like to think you were in front of sort of ahead of the curve and you, you really sort of set the tone and set the, I think the, the benchmark for others who want to join the industry say, if you want to do it well, you got to make sure you compare yourself to those who are doing it really well. And there's only really one guy doing it for the most part. That was Anil Delary. Let's talk about, executive presentation training and coaching absolutely you know when we first met and back in consulting land and, and we were working in agency land it was such a great learning ground and we had the benefit of being exposed to a lot of executives a lot of decision makers a lot of mm -hmm. real great communicators and sometimes not so great communicators and what i learned the most back then was I get to deal with some of the smartest people in the country. Like literally, we would sit across the boardroom from each other like this and, and they would ooze intelligence, these clients, these executives. And then can they get up there and present? And I'd be like, who, who is this gal? Who is this guy, right? It, they would no longer be oozing intelligence. And I was like, gee, there's a gap here. And I uh, worked really hard at researching and coming up with a methodology to, to close that gap and to elevate people's executive presence to the point where they're actually presenting to represent their actual intelligence. So that was the genesis of the whole thing. Um, and you know, bottom line, I think people should be able to communicate better regardless of whether you're an executive or not. And that's really my whole why of getting into the business was I think we as human beings worldwide need to do a better job of communicating. I think the root of most evil in the world is lack of good communication. 
I think the root of most success in the world mm -hmm. is really good communication. So that's why I got into it. I'm passionate about it. I love talking to people about it. And, uh, and here we are 10 plus years later, still having fun. And it's, it's funny how communication and perception are connected. And you may believe you are communicating, but what you're actually doing is sending a bunch of mixed messages to a room. And so all kinds of different, you know, take, take backs or what people yeah. draw from that experience and not everybody's on the same page. And so, uh, and that's, that's, that's where this leadership comes into. And I know that's where you're honing in on mm -hmm. that leader really needs to be a phenomenal communicator. Now, I deal with a lot of leaders who are really bright business executives. Mm -hmm. You see them in the boardroom, they are executing like you wouldn't believe, but you see them communicate either one-on-one -on -one with a key employee or to a group of prospects. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Ooh, it's not clear. It's not effective. They're not exuding that executive presence. They kind of look like a deer in the headlights up there. That's what we're working against. And that's what the whole methodology is about in working with them, either in a group setting or in a one-on-one -on -one coaching setting. Oftentimes, great leaders are analytical in nature. They see the numbers, they see the landscape, but then all of a sudden you throw human interaction to it. And, and now all of a sudden the timing's way off. And it's tough to take someone who's very analytical who, and, and say, okay, now present to human beings, present to a room, own the room. You know your stuff, but how do you get the knowledge of your stuff out from your soul, because you have a great passion for it, out to this group where they'll go, oh, okay, I get it, yes. Yeah, yeah, th there's a great line I heard from a coach, just a, a high-level business coach before, mm -hmm. and I love it. Uh, she said, content is king, yep. always has been, always will be. But engagement, engagement is the queen, right? And the queen tends to run the show. Yeah. So without, without the queen, the king's really nothing. So you could literally, like literally, have the best content in the world as a business executive. Like your balance sheet can be pristine. The way you yeah. talk about the numbers can be pristine. But if you don't do it in an engaging way, guess what? You don't have the best content in the world anymore. It's yeah. just the numbers. It's just ordinary, boring content, just like every other business executive. When you have that combination of great content plus incredible engagement, you have the king and queen, you got something special. You have engaging. And I always point back to an old boss of mine at, at Cognos where I used to work. Uh, you know, I grew up at Cognos and there's that guy, Ron Zambonini, who everyone talks about. And that guy, that guy had the perfect combination of impeccable content, supersonic personality and engagement. And, you know, he goes down as a legend here in Ottawa, here in Canada and around the technology world. Reminds you of the world of stand-up comedy where a guy has great jokes, great content. He goes up there and he's going to do one of the two things. He's going to deliver it or he's going to execute it, right? And, and practice uh, knowing, your, knowing your subject matter, realizing that presenting is a craft. Yeah. And that you continually hone it because as soon as you think you got it figured out, you realize you don't. So what are the keys then? to present well? Yeah, that's, a, that's a big question. It's a big that's one, a, yeah. That's a $6 trillion question, right? We don't, trillion. Talk, we don't talk about billions anymore. We talk about no, trillions. It's trillions, yeah. <laughs> that's the big question. And, you know, just back to your last point on, you know, it's very tough to do and it, it's a learned skill. Mm -hmm. I hear from a lot of prospects and clients at the executive level say, you know, Neil, I just wasn't born a, a great presenter. Mm -hmm. But the truth is no one was, no one came out of the womb, a great presenter, right? Mm -hmm. It is a learned skill. So what do you need? Like what, what's the methodology? What's, what's the key to success here? Yeah. I, I like talking to clients about four key things and, and I keep it nice and simple for them so that it's, it's kind of me eating my own dog food and, and keeping it simple. Right. Number one is organization. How are you structuring your presentation? Two is slides. Everyone yeah. can. Everyone loves talking about slides. We have a and very they can, and they can hide behind PowerPoint. They oh, can hide behind slides. Oh, can they ever? And, right. and there we have a slide centric culture in our business culture. So we we're talking about how can we have slides work for you, not against you. That's two. 
three is delivery. That's uh, strategic use of your body when you present. That's there's right. an interesting angle on that in our virtual world. And then four is my favorite. You hit on it a couple times already, and that's strategic preparation. Mm -hmm. How do you know your stuff? Are you ready to deliver your stuff? That's the method. That's the methodology. Those are the four key things. I hit it with every. I hit it with a CEO client earlier today. Mm -hmm. I talked to it about uh, with a group client on Monday, right? Group of twenty executives from the organization. We keep hitting on that exact methodology and those four key things. So you have a CEO or you have a COO who's pretty successful, got a great track record, all kinds of success through the years, and is going to present and. Uh, Ego can get in the way. They assume that, well, I can do everything else really well, then I can certainly go out and present. It's like the athlete who thinks, okay, I'm athletic, so I'm going to go figure out, I'm going to go play golf. I'm going to be a scratch golfer, and it doesn't translate. Where does ego come into play and how that can be an Achilles heel for a presenter? Huge. Uh, talk about this all the time with, with kind of supporters of executives. So let's use the... Uh, the director of communications, as an example, who calls me up all the time and says, Anil, I need you to work with this CEO or the CFO or the senior vice president of sales. And listen, uh, he's got a bit of an ego. Uh, he thinks he's really good, but we think that he maybe could have some opportunity improvement. And I'm like, he sucks, doesn't he? <laughs> he sucks. And that's why you're calling me, right? Okay. Yeah. So the beauty of bringing an outsider in is I don't work for the CEO, right? Mm -hmm. I'm brought in as a hired gun. I'm brought in to take his or her game to another level. And so I kind of have a license to be very, very honest, but in a professional way, really partnering with that executive and being very honest with them. So I've had situations where I've had to tell C-level clients, hey, listen, you've got some really good things going for you as an executive. You should be proud of yourself. You're just not presenting well, right? Just because you've been doing this for 25 years, that does not equate to the fact that you do it well. Right. So let's work together over the next few minutes, the next few hours, the next few days, the next few months on taking you to another level, right? Once again, coming back to this concept of this is not a, I was born with it skill. This is a learned skill. I love your sports analogies, Ken, and I love sports myself. My right. kids love sports. We love talking about it. So I like bringing up the story of Tiger Woods. So mm -hmm. Tiger Woods, between the uh, dates of 2004 to 2010, was literally the best golfer in the history of the world. Unbeatable. In the history of golf, in the history of the world, he was the best. He worked with a coach every single day. Yeah. His coach was Hank Haney. So if Tiger Woods, at the top of his game, the best in the history of the world, if that guy is working with a coach to take his game to another level, why aren't you, Miss CEO, working with a coach every day yeah. to take your game to another level? It's that simple. And having that objective voice that you can trust uh, requires an authenticity on both ends for you and your client. And it also requires a trust and know that sometimes in the process of getting better, you're going to have to hug the cactus and come to terms with the fact that you don't do everything well. Yes. And, and you also don't want to get caught into the trap of only doing what you do really well all the time, because you can be really missing out on a great opportunity to become something special in another realm in another manner. If you just worked a little harder over here, and so if it's the same old, same old presentation, and then your COO after training and working with you gets in there and does something completely different, uh, you know, at, you build credit with your audience for one, and they look forward to seeing you the second time because you want to create that water cooler effect, right? You want to leave them talking a week from now, a month from now about that presentation that Joanne Smith gave on you know, microeconomics. It was an hour, but it felt like 30 minutes, and I was thirsty for more, and I can't wait to get more from from that speaker. I like this. Like just last night, I was having a, this conversation with a client where we talk about being remarkable mm -hmm. and clients of mine know I bring this up all the time. I'm like, I think you, I think you kind of rare should be going for remarkable every single time you mm -hmm. communicate, every single time you present. And you're like, okay, what the heck does that mean? 
it's a, it sounds really nice, right? What's it mean? Three things, three things when I talk about remarkability, three measurement points. Number one, someone comes up to you after you present says, Ken, that was really good. Thanks. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. Has to be a genuine thank you. Can't be the nice Canadian thank you, right? Yeah. You know, the nice Canadian thing about, hey, Ken, that was the worst presentation I've ever seen. <laughs> thank you. No? Thank you for ending the presentation. Ken. Yeah. Can't be that. It's got to be a genuine, hey, man, I got something out of that. That was awesome. Thanks. That's one. That tends to be the easiest one. Right. Two is when two or more people from your audience kind of turn to each other and kind of during or after your presentation, they start mm -hmm. talking about you. They're like, hey, that Ken guy was really good. He, here's what I liked about Ken's message. What did you think of Ken's message? Some kind of buzz right. in the room as a re result of you and what you presented. That's two. Three is my, my favorite. Three is someone leaves Ken's presentation. They go up and at some point between the next five minutes, and the next five years, mm -hmm. they mention you, Ken, and your presentation to someone who wasn't even there. Yeah. Have, you, have you seen this kind of rare guy? Have you seen this guy? For, you got to see this. You got to work with this guy. This guy is amazing. Yeah. That's remarkable. I think that's what you and I should be going for every single time in every communication opportunity. I know that sounds lofty. I know that sounds mm -hmm. unattainable. It's not. I push clients on it every single day. But to do that, though, to be successful and create that down the road, they're talking about you, you have to give them more than a presentation, don't you? Uh, from Just from a giving standpoint, a gift authentic, because you can see someone up there who's really just passionate and can, who can leave the presentation that can, because something's come up in their mind that they believe is of value in a very organic thought process and organic sharing fashion and say, Wait, this just came to mind. I want to tell you a quick story. I, I didn't prepare for it, but I, I think the story is applicable and I think it's going to be valuable to the audience. And you can read the room, you give to the room. And when you give to the room, the room will give back. You got it. I think the best way to give to the room is not with your corporate bullet points, yeah. right? Uh, not with your 10 point plan, mm -hmm. but I think the best way to give to the room and in, in turn, get what you want is to share that story, story, example, or anecdote mm -hmm. story. There's a, there's a lot of research going on these days. Uh, I would say in the last 36 months about stories, storytelling within a corporate environment, within a business environment yeah. and how incredibly powerful it is. Uh, my favorite story on stories about Steve jobs, right? He was mm -hmm. always thought of as a great presenter. Yeah. I would point back to that 2005 commencement speech she gave at the university. Yeah, I remember that. And if you haven't heard of it, if anyone listening here hasn't heard of it, like just YouTube search 2005 mm -hmm. Steve Jobs. It's the first thing that pops up. Yeah. Tens of millions of views goes down as one of the greatest commencement speeches of all time. Yeah. So think of that statement, right? Yeah. All it was was three stories. That's all it was. 15 minutes three stories. That was it. That was the whole thing. And when you listen to the stories that he tells, mm -hmm. that anyone tells, I would argue that each and every person in the audience gets something personal out of those stories. And I think, I think, and we're all raconteurs. We all have stories. Yeah. There's a defining moment. We decide whether that story is worth sharing, if it's valuable to the rest of the world. I think that's part of the problem for people who don't think they can present is that they honestly believe that it's not that they can't present is that what they present isn't of value that people really don't want right. to know. But because we all walk a certain, our journey, we're going all kinds of different directions. There's all kinds of stories that are available to us. Yeah. And uh, I love that authentic speaker that goes up and shares a story. Okay. We're going to get to the meat and potatoes. Of stuff. We're going to do all these things we said we're going to do, but I want to tell you a story. I want, I want to connect with you at that level because I'm going to ask you to participate. I'm going to ask you to give something back to me during the next hour or day or week, whatever it's going to be. And I need to make sure that I create an environment where you're comfortable giving to me. For me to do that, I got to be, I got to be that guy who says, stands in the middle of traffic with no clothes on says, here I am. Yeah. And, and let's be perfectly imperfect and enjoy this, this, because oftentimes you look at a presenter and you say, you see a Ted talks presentation, you go, well, this person's amazing. Clearly, when they were born, the trumpets resound and the clouds open up, and right, and 
but if you watch Brene Brown or some of these other speakers, you go, what they're selling is humanity. Yeah. That, that word that you use, authenticity, mm-hmm. that comes up so often in, in corporate environments. Yeah. And, I'm, and I, I just press clients on, okay, prove it to me. Be authentic. Yeah. Yeah. That, those six corporate bullet points that you just regurgitated me that I had a lot of trouble staying awake while you regurgitated <laughs> to me, uh, those are fine. You can keep those in there. What's the story to back it up? Yeah, Tell yeah. me how you met with a client and they told you this. What's the Tell connector? Me, it's the connector. Tell yeah. me about how a client told you off as the CEO of the company because your yeah. products didn't work for them. Yeah. Tell me that story. Be authentic in that way. And I think it's, it's a great point. So here we are. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard, but we're in a global pandemic. And life is changing as we know it. And the new normal will not look anything like what we were living, existing in a few months ago. Presenting and connecting. Not only is now the CEO or the COO presenting, now managers are and team members are. And it's virtual. And they're being, they're being judged. And so they're probably... F- just as nervous about presenting now and they can't do the old just imagine my audience is naked it'll get me through this experience that's not going to work no what do you see how are people going to navigate these waters so i don't know man as you can imagine over the last 16 weeks we're in week 16 of this thing now uh i've been bombarded with this this is what every client wants to talk about Mm. uh the concept of what I call distance communications. So when I talk about distance communications and when clients talk about it, they say, okay, I'm no longer in the same room or the same city necessarily, or the same continent as who I'm talking to and who I'm presenting Mm. to. Um, Here's the problem is it's, it's easy to actually do. It's easy for me and you Mm -hmm. to click the link and poof, we're on video, right? We just, we just did it when we started this thing. Click, poof, oh my gosh, there's Ken. He's in a completely different part of the city and I'm talking to him live. This is, this is nuts. This is unbelievable. Yeah. It's easy to do it. It's not easy to do it well. And yeah. what I'm seeing is as we move from week number two to week number 12 to 16, organizations are saying, okay, we did it. We survived. I can't mm-hmm. believe everyone is successfully working from home. Yeah. Maybe we should start looking at doing this well, right? Is, isn't that the funny thing? Because on the outside, everybody said, oh my God, what do we do? Okay, we got to get Zoom. We got to get, we got to connect. We got to stay connected. What do we do? Okay. And everybody thought, just don't press that one button because before you know it, you're going to be launching missiles at North Korea, <laughs> right? Right. Oh my God. It was the fear factor. Everybody was so engaged in fear and realized, hold on, just breathe. And even if you, even if it does go south, it goes south. And I'll, I'll be open and honest with you. This has been my biggest stumbling block as a person who has to has had to pivot my entire business, my entire yeah. being. I've had to pivot the whole thing from, you know, being 95% in person to, to 100% online and having to do this with every single client and every single group. And I'll be honest with you, technology was my biggest stumbling block. Okay. Uh, tech not, because it was so difficult to control, right? Just like we did today, I would get on nice and early. I would make yeah. sure the picture is perfect. I would make sure the audio is working. I'd make sure the video is working. Make sure my kids know that, hey, I'm on with Ken until 1 p.m. Don't mm-hmm. do me a favor and maybe don't run through the house so much. <laughs> and so, so, I'm like, I got all angles covered. Yeah. But then, oh my gosh, you know, Ken's Wi Fi connection is weak today, or my Wi Fi connect, yeah. connection is weak today. And kind of struggling with that mentally and how fatiguing that is mentally uh, is tough. And it's something that over time, as an executive, as a coach, you kind of work with and roll with the punches. But there's a there's this distinct pattern, distinct kind of methodology of going through and how do you rectify that mentally? How do you get over that mentally so that you can get through your next webinar or your next video conference or your next virtual meeting? Yeah real good compelling way even if there was technical problems how did you rectify and how did you get back up on your horse right away almost like the technical problem never happened and how do you counter punch how do you counter punch how do you counter punch 
I'll tell you a story. I was on a, a group session call with a client, uh, probably week four into the crisis. Mm -hmm. And I'm just about 20 people on the call and right. I'm in, in the middle of it. I'm giving it to them. And uh, I just noticed kind of out of the corner of my eye that just participants start dropping, right? Okay. Very, very, very methodically just start dropping. And then poof, mm -hmm. it's just me on the call. I'm like, okay, something went wrong here. Yeah. It's probably me. There's no way it could be all of them. Yeah, you personalize it. So I start beating myself up. Like, what do I need to do? What do I need to reboot? Or what, what do I, I need to do? Yeah. Uh, I start getting some text messages from the client saying, hey, Neil, just so you know, uh, our corporate network went down and everyone had to go through the corporate network VPN in to, to be on the call today. So don't worry about it. It usually rectify itself in a few minutes. We'll be back on in a second. Okay. So here I am beating myself up yeah. over this technical problem. It was completely 100% beyond my control. Once we got back on and everyone joined, we didn't skip a beat. We got back up on that horse mm -hmm. and I started almost exactly at the point that we left off. Yeah. And that was the key. I actually got comments afterwards saying, I can't believe how unbelievably well we all handled the technical failure. Like it was a mm -hmm. colossal technical failure. And we all handled it and got right back on the horse and started almost like without skipping a beat. Well, it's funny. We watch a movie like Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks is Jim Lovell. And we all say, man, I really want to do that. You all want to do it right up until you're in the spaceship and something goes wrong. You're saying, okay, I wish I was in ground control. I wish I was in Houston, but yeah. you figured it out. And you mentioned something interesting. And for those who don't know you, uh, you walk into, you're that type of guy where you walk in and everybody just likes you. You're just a really good guy. But having that card taken oh, out of your hand, right? You lose that card at the poker table. Okay, sorry, taking that, that ace out of your hand, pal. And now you got to still play cards, but now at the poker table, four cards instead of your fifth. That had to be tough for you. Very, very, very tough. Yeah. Uh, and we are very self-critical, right? So mm -hmm. uh, when I didn't have the same level of interaction with a client or with a prospect and, and we didn't seem to be jiving, I'd yeah. be self-critical. And then, you know, I'd, you'd get the email after saying, you know, hey, Neil, thanks for taking the time. That was an incredible meeting. Let's go ahead with this, this, this. I'm like, whoa, did I ever misread that? Yeah. Uh, I thought that was horrible. Uh, okay, why am I being so self-critical? And I think that's, have, have you heard of this thing called Zoom fatigue? I have. So, it's interesting, yeah. So new concept, new term out there. And some really interesting research going on about it, about how we crave nonverbal communication, mm -hmm. right? So while I might be staring at the camera here, I'd love to be looking down at you the whole time and see, yeah. okay, what's, what's Ken's reaction to what I'm saying? Uh, and I'm craving, it's a lot more difficult for me to get your nonverbal in this video environment mm -hmm. than it is if we were sitting in the same boardroom together. Yeah. So, there's what the scientists are telling us is, or what the industrial psychologists are telling us is subconsciously, this is exhausting for us. Yeah. We're on five zoom, eight zoom calls a day. And it's exhausting because we're, we're craving that nonverbal and we're not getting the same level of nonverbal. Mm -hmm. We're questioning ourselves and self criticizing ourselves. And that's just simply exhausting. And what you find, what I'm finding is a lot of people tell me if you're seeing the same, mm -hmm they're actually moving more, not completely, but more towards this audio only where they'll, they'll turn off their camera yeah. and be in the call or be in the virtual meeting, but they won't be on camera the whole time. Uh, that's an interesting tactic to kind of just as a self-preservation. I, I don't want to be just exhausted at the end of the day. Yeah. And being on yeah. Video. What do you well, think? I, think of I, I, I agree that what happens is people first excited about the whole idea. I could work from home. I could stay at home, especially, if, you know, if the, if the kids aren't tearing the place apart and, and you, you learn to be efficient. I think that's really, really, was really, I think people have discovered is that uh, employees probably, employers probably thought, oh my God, well, they're at home. They're just going to have toga parties all day and, and they're not going to get any work done. Right. But people are just as efficient, if not more efficient in this setting, but that connection, that human connection, it's part of our DNA. And to sit there, right? It's part and of this mass experiment that we're in. It really is. Massive 
We're in a massive economic and business experiment. We're in a massive healthcare experiment, massive uh, government experiment. Um, no one knows what the next six days, and let alone the next six months, is going to look like. And everyone's just experiment. What I I'm find not- kind of neat is that yeah. human beings have this uncanny ability to just adapt. Yes. Like 17 weeks ago, if I told you, Ken, get this, every single company that you know of, every yeah. single organization you know of, all the employees, all going to be working from home. Yeah. And they, for the most part, uh, kind of a really, really good one, they won't really skip a beat. Yeah. Some will actually be better as a result. You'd be like, Anil, forget it. You know, you're, you're joshing me here. It can't happen. Yeah. Yeah. be a disaster and here we are this uncanny ability to adapt it's just uh it's really neat yeah okay because we're des- i think we're designed to connect with each other communicate and then collaborate on a bid to conquer whatever the challenge that lays ahead and i think in terms of that the study of we as a species human beings on this planet there's some alien at area 51 going yeah it is a, we are studying you Secondly, uh, you don't need all those Allen keys from Ikea. And three, all those guys who bought all that toilet paper from day one, barking up the wrong tree, pal. If that was your priority. Just a mass experiment. I just found really it is. So, so interesting how all the toilet paper was gone from the aisles. Yet in my grocery store, at least, they they sell kind of wine and, and craft beer. Yeah. And all the wine and craft beer was still there. I'm like, talk about not having your priorities straight. I know. All the toilet paper. Gone. What, what about the beer aisle? You guys, you guys are sheltered in place. You don't have any booze at home. Like I remember watching The Walking Dead when that was huge, and I didn't see anybody around go, wait, we need guns and ammunition, but first, somebody go get 48 rolls of Charmin. We need it real quick just in case something goes south here. I will throw toilet paper at the zombies. But, and, but I think and, that was just, what that is though is that us trying to figure out the adapt. What do we need? What do we need? Okay. Some leader said, we need toilet paper. Let's go. And as soon as you put it on social media, some guy with a cart, 200 rolls of toilet paper, we got to get toilet paper. And following the herd. That's what it was. Following it's funny. I uh, talk about stories. I remember I, I took uh, philosophy 101 at Laurier and the prof was Peter Jacobson. He was a first year prof, hippie prof. You could smell the pot off and yeah, that tweed jack with the patches, the whole thing. And I thought he was the greatest prof. I learned more from him than any other prof I had, prof I had because he, one day he came in and said, I want to introduce this thing called Theseus Paradox. And it was about uh, identity. And he says, you have a ship in port at location A and it's going to sail across this massive body of water and get to point B, its destination. But during that time, we're going to change every piece of the ship with an identical piece. So that I, he says, I I asked you this now, knowing all that information, is it the same ship? And everybody went on about, well, spiritually and the molecular makeup of it and no, yes. And they argued back and forth. And I enjoyed listening to the argument, but I sort of stepped outside of it and said, hold on a second. Now, if you, we were on the ship and the captain walks into the tavern after we've just got back and we're having a good time, enjoying a beer, some rum and relaxing. I got an idea, guys. This is what we're going to do. We're going to sail. And while we do that, we're going to replace every piece of the ship. Who's with me? And you might get the one guy who just absolutely believes in the captain, right? I'm with you. But the rest of the guys, I need a little more information. And there's the five W's. So when you're you're a messenger, you're presenting the five W's. Who, what, when, why, and, and how. Who, what, when, where, and what. Sorry. And you need to share that information to give his people. So five W's and one H is what I'm trying to say, but <laughs> information, content, share it. And then, if, then you say, okay, now I got half the boat with me. Okay. The other half needs more information, but you, at least you get, you're starting to build and you start again, authentic. Now you can't, you can't use cliches. You can't present and say, you know, all the cliches and, and say all the right things. You have to have a message that is authentic. You have to have information that's authentic, that, that is valuable to your audience for them to get activated. Let, let me throw this back to you. Here's sure. what I loved about the story you just told is it reinforces this point that stories stick, right? They they you just really told me do. a very, very intriguing, engaging story about the four W's and the H. And you could have just said, hey, who, what, where, when, where, how yeah. really matters. 
but instead you told me about Professor Jacobson, yeah. who, you know, I don't want to age you, but it was probably 25 plus years ago. It was a while ago, yeah. Yeah. The fact that I went, I cl went to class was amazing too. It was so remarkable yeah. that you, can you remember this from over 25 years ago? You mm -hmm. remember the guy's name, you remember what he smelt like and what he wore. You remember the story that he told, and then you in turn are re are retelling that story to me and reinforcing a point. What you've okay. just done there is elevate your executive presence. You've got great content. You were also very engaging with it because you told it in the form of a story. That's what I loved about it, man. It's like yeah. you've been coached or something. I know what the interesting thing was. The first time I told it, I was nervous about telling it because I didn't think it was all that remarkable. But then people go, yeah, and you go, Okay, uh, that's a, that, that one goes into my, my saddlebag. I can use that. And then all the stories are the remarkable stories. And you get the habit of mountain climbing, you get in the habit of sharing stories. And then you get the room and say, okay, now we have to get to work. Yeah, and man. Bank those stories and yeah. use those stories, right? Tell that Professor Jacobson story again and again. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a, a client who, long term client, long time client, one of my favorites. I don't want to mention her by name, but mm -hmm. CEO client, uh, been working with her for nine plus years and she's a Newfoundlander. She's a Newfoundland yeah. natural storyteller. Yeah. A very good storyteller. When I first started working with her, she had the traditional presentation, very corporate, very corporate messagey, right. incredibly boring, incredible, just putting people to sleep. Fast forward to today, I would say she is a story-based presenter where almost all of her speeches, all of her presentations are story-based. You know, starting off with, hey, thanks so much for your time and attention today. I, yeah. I'm looking forward to telling you just five stories today, right? Five stories about these key important topics. She goes on, tells the five stories, gets the standing ovation. People are like, oh my gosh, that was incredible. She is an internationally renowned speaker today yeah. because of being story-based and because of being incredibly engaging. That's, uh, and I love that. And, and what they discover along the way is they discover their own personal ethos. They discover what they believe in. And once you know what you believe in and you're willing to share it, then boy, yeah. you're on the right track. Uh, Chris Corvo is our producer. He's up in upstate New York with a sunburn up in his cabin, uh, not near, uh, I guess you're at the Prescott in Tonawanda in the Tri-County region. Um, Chris, can you pull up Anil's website, www.saveitlikesully.com? And he's gonna bring that up. And, and you have all your social media as well, right? Anil, you have Twitter and do you do the Instagram thing? I don't do Instagram, I save Instagram for my son. Yeah. <laughs> My my son and I have a, a sports podcast we do together, and and kind of goes on uh, Instagram to to promote that. I'm okay. I'm big on LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. Yeah. I know you're on LinkedIn on a regular basis, Ken. I think it's a very powerful tool for spreading your message and really collaborating with stakeholders. It gets pigeonholed a bit as a yeah. HR tool. Yeah. Of okay, if you want to recruit people, use LinkedIn, and yeah, it's it's good for that. I look at it as a great way of connecting, connecting with past clients, connecting with future clients, and kind of giving everyone a taste of what presentation excellence really means, and a little bit of a glimpse into what I'm doing with clients, the kind of work I'm doing with clients, how I'm helping clients, and then also some really kind of newer researchy stuff around presentations, presentation excellence, distance communications, what's yeah. the newest research telling us? I love LinkedIn for that. I want to switch gears a little bit and, and one, first off, your thoughts on uh, President Trump in Tulsa, not so much him himself, but the effort through social media, TikTok and the K-pop fans to reserve all the tickets and prevent a sellout. Uh, strategically, I thought it was fantastic. And the fact that it, nobody knew about it until post-event was miraculous. What did you think of that? Unbelievable. Uh, yeah. What what mainly uh, caught my eye about that is how, you know, the president of the free world and his wacky team, yeah. they didn't see it coming. They didn't see it coming. They, they didn't know how to react to the last minute about it. it the, the genie was out of the bottle. There was nothing they could do. And it makes me think, man, here we are. What are we in? We're late June. Yeah. 
and we have to we're gonna wait until early November, November for the election. Can you imagine what's gonna happen between now and then and the circus we're gonna see? Uh, 2020 will definitely go down as one of the wackiest years of all time. And that U.S. election is just going to be the cherry on the nasty Sunday, I guess. You watch him, you go, bad presenter. But he has a base that's rabid. How does he keep people? How does he hook people? Because from our perspective, we look at it and go, my, this just, it's just out of hand. Like here in Canada, the only thing that pisses us off gets us fired up is when someone touches our goalie in a hockey game, right? <laughs> But in the States, it's just, it's just such a mess and the venomous attack going both ways. What's going on there? And, and, and how does he keep his audience? Yeah, extremely, extremely polarizing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I talk to business people about this with respect to not, not politics per se, because it's kind yeah. of a no-go zone. Third rail, yeah. Yeah, it's a no-go zone. Um, but I talk about polarization as a tool right. when you're communicating. So what do I mean by that? Are there opportunities, largely with internal presentations within yeah. a company, of an opportunity to go kind of one end of the spectrum really hard right. in the hopes of getting some really interesting conversation going from both ends of the spectrum yeah. so that you kind of have that broader perspective. So uh, I think in politics, it's kind of completely gone off the rails yeah. where they're they're so polarized that that whole middle that whole centrist politician that whole centrist party yeah that doesn't exist anymore it doesn't right yeah and it's it's funny to look back at old debates between um you know uh, i think it was like walter mondale and yeah and bush senior and they'd be debating and it would actually be a very civilized mm -hmm. debate and they would actually complement each other haphazardly during the debate it was like oh my gosh i can't believe how civilized this is yeah and it was less than a generation ago and here we are today it's um i don't know it, it'll be a, a real circus to watch yeah i don't think we'll ever forget it and uh it's it's democracy at its best and worst all at the same time where the, the democracy gets to choose right you get to yeah. choose what your next four years is going to be like. Go ahead and choose. Yeah, he's telling people what they want to hear versus what they need to hear. And yeah. it's like it's like that. It's like that, that high school football player doing a presentation for the whole audience at school. And he blanks out in the middle of it and just yells out, Brookville Blues Rock, and walks off the stage to get the standing ovation. Like, That's right. Okay. And can you combine all of this with just another kind of cherry in on the Sunday, which is the mm. civil unrest? around Black yeah. Lives Matter and all this. And you, you just look at leaders' ability to communicate around this, not only from a political spectrum, but from a corporate spectrum, right? There's yeah. a lot of corporate leaders, a lot of people listening to this, mm -hmm. this talk today who are scared to talk about the whole Black Lives Matter situation, yeah. the whole social unrest matter. And it's tough. They don't teach you this in MBA school, they right? Don't. And I, I love the story of, of Doug Parker. You know Doug Parker? No. Doug Parker is the CEO of American Airlines. I love okay. this story. He's the CEO of American Airlines. And it was about two and a half weeks ago, kind of during the, the, real, the real kind of firestorm of, of racial unrest and right. civil unrest in the U.S. And Doug Parker's on CNBC. And this guy's in the hot seat. Right? Yeah. Think about what this guy has to go through. Uh, his entire business is down 90 plus percent. Yeah, people want right. refunds. People want refunds. His entire business has has kind of disappeared. Right. And he's got to navigate his way through it. He gets on live TV and they are hammering him yeah. on racial unrest, Black Lives Matter. What is American Airlines doing? Right? Yeah. Massive uh, customer base of his, probably African American. He's probably got a, a pretty significant employee base that is African American everyone's listening to every single word he's saying and they're hammering him yeah and this guy is squirming in his seat he's stumbling he's bumbling and i'm watching him going wow this guy is not even close to ready and he's the ceo of american airlines on live yeah. tv 
and he is so uncomfortable with just the topic itself. I'm not saying that he's racist. I'm not saying that I, for all I know, he's a unbelievable guy. And sure. it's just not ready, right? Yeah. He's not ready for the firestorm of live TV and that particular topic. Last part of the story, the yeah. last question was asked by a guy named Phil LeBeau, who's an unbelievable reporter on CNBC. Phil goes, let me very awkwardly switch topics. Mm -hmm. And Doug, I want to ask you a business question. How are things going in Ameri with American Airlines? How's ridership looking? Are you guys recovering? And this guy, Doug Parker, it's almost like he swapped himself out with a completely different person. Yeah. He lights up. He comes out with this most perfect, eloquent answer yeah. that is business oriented. And it's one he was ready for. Right, it's yeah. when he he, would, he was relishing the opportunity to talk about it. There's the difference between being ready mm -hmm. and not being ready, being yeah. in the firestorm and not being ready, and being in the firestorm and being ready. Yeah. Executive presence. It's so important around all of these um, wacky issues that we need to deal with in 2020. And I think engagement is so important. So important to ask questions. I remember the last story I'll share real quick. Uh, when I was in my TV days, I was covering the Sens, that Stanley Cup run when they went lost to Anaheim in the Cup. But they had just eliminated the Jersey Devils in Jersey in game five. Dominant game. They won. They're a better hockey team. We got our post-game clips all recorded and sent off back to the station here in Ottawa. And uh, If you know Newark, New Jersey, and that surrounding area, you didn't, don't exactly go touring around at night, but we had the big new RO logos on the truck and whole bit. We found a pub and grabbed a beer, but the kitchen wasn't open. So we said, I'm starving. I got to get some food. So we drove around. We ended up in downtown Newark. We ended up at a White Castle. And uh, a White Castle hamburger joint in the States is much different than, say, a McDonald's or a Burger King here. One, there's no bulletproof glass here in Canada. There is in the States, right? So we pull up and I'm bald, six foot one. My cameraman's six foot four bald. So we look like a couple of members of the Aryan Nation get out of this truck, right? In the middle of Newark, New Jersey. And, but we're starving and we walk in and it was funny you note. Know, the first thing we did, it was, we explained our story real fast. Yeah. Hey, we're from Canada. Yeah. We're, we're from Canada. We're just hockey. We're from Canada and we're leaving. Right. And, and I thought about in that moment thinking they lived that existence, members of the black community, members of the visual minorities, Latinos, uh, they live with that existence. And I remember we, you order a, ten, a, a bag of 10 slider hamburgers. If you've been to a White Castle, great burgers. But I'm sitting down and there's a gentleman sitting there with his wife and African-American gentleman. And, and, and she was just a beautiful black woman. And, and I'm chatting. I'm a chatty guy. And I want to find out a story. And it connects to my dad. My dad played pro baseball down in Tampa with Pete Rose and Richie Allen. Uh, my mom is mulatto. My grandfather is black. To live together, my mom had to dye her hair blonde, and they got married down in Tampa. So all the white guys on his team were like, who the heck is this guy? Bit of an alien, Canadian guy with a, a woman of color as a wife. And the, the, his black teammates, Richie Allen, was like, where are you from? And he was an outspoken athlete, outspoken black player, to the point where he's probably the one guy who should be in the All-Star, should be in the Hall of Fame, but hasn't been selected because the voters, all the white writers won't vote him in. Um, I, I share that because and segue now to back to White Castle. I sit down and I asked him, and I asked the gentleman, introduced myself and told him our story. I said, Let me ask you a question. This was two months after Barack Obama had announced his run for the presidency. I said, Why doesn't the entire black community just get together and vote and change the entire fabric of the United States of America? Seems simple. Yeah. And he looked at me, he says, Do you have six hours? It's complicated. It is on the surface, on the surface, as simple as it is to give everybody the opportunity to live equal rights, regardless of your skin color, your gender, your religion. It's complicated because there are people who are in power, who are enjoying the status of power, who don't want to give it up. And that's the complicated part is getting them to try to give it up. It, the thing that you hit on so well there is this is complicated. Yeah. Uh, this may, and from a leadership standpoint, this may be the greatest, most important leadership issue and opportunity mm. of our lifetime, right? Yeah. 
this is complicated, this is multi-generational, as you just described, this is multi-layered, this mm -hmm. is not easy. What I kind of like about it is people are talking. That story you just shared yeah. are the stories that need to be shared. And this is the way I'm guiding my clients, my executive clients, I'll be frank, mm -hmm. the majority of my clients are old white guys. Yeah. And um, I give them credit for allowing me to talk about this with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll share with you what I share with them, this, this concept of, you know, as, as business executives, uh, many are infatuated with the balance sheet, mm -hmm. right? The financial balance sheet, where assets need to equal liabilities and shareholder equity. That's something we learn first day of business school. Sure. What I want to talk about with them is, well, what's what's your life and ethics balance sheet like mm -hmm. for your organization? So on this side, we're ticking lots of boxes, right? We're saying, okay, there's some really good Canadian companies out there who do this. We have the right policies. We have the right procedures. Uh, we denounce racism. We, uh, we have a board that is very nice and diverse. We have a management team that's very nice and diverse ticking locks of lots of boxes right and i'm like good that's good you've, you've covered this side of of the balance sheet i want to talk about this side of the balance sheet and yeah. this is this is about you you the leader you the kind of older to middle-aged white guy mm -hmm. who's in the hot seat who's in the ceo or coo or cfo position what are you doing here and we talk about very specific strategies on what they can do to increase their perspective yeah. and to not do the, dare I say, the eye roll when uh, the term Black Lives Matter comes up. Oh, geez, mm -hmm. another Black Lives Matter situation? Okay, yeah. what, what happened this time? We did this six months ago. What, what, what is it this time? Yeah. Instead of that, kind of increasing your perspective, and there's some very specific things I ask clients to do on a personal level. It mm -hmm. just increases their perspective and just not only makes them better people, but really makes them better leaders as a result. And I give them credit yeah. for listening to me during it. I, I'm doing it myself. I'm trying to get better perspective as a man of color who mm -hmm. lives in a great city of Ottawa, but we have our own issues here in Ottawa with respect to racism. And I'm increasing my perspective with uh, members of other communities like uh, the Chinese community and the African Canadian community. And, um, you know, it, as I increase my perspective, I find that I'm a better consultant, I'm a better coach, and I'm a better leader myself. It's something, it's something yeah. we can all do. I wish everybody played on a CFL team because you have, you have Canadians, white and black, French, English, East, West Coast, West Coast, right? American Canadian, American Canadians, you had Southern Americans, you had Northern Americans, you have West Coast Americans, you have Midwest Americans, white, black, big schools, small schools. And uh, when you gather as a group here and go to training camp and the team is made all of a sudden now you got this great mixture. I can't tell you the score of a football game in ill if I tried, but I can tell you about Lonzel Hill, Damon Allen. I can tell you about David Williams and Gerald Alphin, all those teammates. And, uh, I like to think that they can tell all their friends about me because it wasn't about the score. It was about the relationships and knowing the people around you. Yeah. You learning their perspective, their That's story, it. what they That's had to it. go through. Yep. Uh, it's yeah. so important to share those stories. No. It's amazing how we keep coming back to stories and communication and understanding and perspective. It's yeah. uh, it's all connected. And it's funny when you're presenting, a lot of presenters will say, I need to build content, I need content. And they don't even think about a story. They don't think about the stories, which is- Let me get the perfect slide. I need that yeah. slide to be perfect. When wow. in the reality, very few people at the end of a presentation go, uh, that presentation really sucked, yeah. but I loved his slides. Yeah. Right? Very few Those people. Killer slides. Yeah, slides <laughs> beautiful. He but those slides, very few people say them. Yeah, what well, well, after you present, if someone suggests you go to art school right <laughs> afterwards, <laughs> that's a yeah. sure sign you present, your presentation didn't hit the mark. Okay, so Nil, here we are for all those presenters out there. 
four things again. Let's let's uh, recap the four things that if you're going to present, what should they be focused on? Awesome. If you have a presentation later today, later this week, later this month, I want you to remember these four things. I want you to strategically organize and structure it. Number two, slides. I want your slides to be nice and simple, no complex yep. slides. Number three, I want you to think about your physical delivery. In our virtual environment, that means strategic use of your head, mm -hmm. hands, your eyes, and your voice. Number four, I want you to be ready. I want you to prepare. That means booking an hour in your calendar to practice your next presentation in front of that really important customer or stakeholder or supplier or a partner, then take the hour. It really shows when you prepare effectively. Those are the four things I want you to remember. That's awesome. Hey, no, thank you so much, brother. I appreciate it. My man, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I'm looking forward to the day when we can sit down over a frosty beverage and do it instead. Without a doubt. And maybe we'll be at a Red Blacks game. We've got to watch some CFL football. Okay. Love That'd it. be great. That's Anil Delary. He's the uh, managing uh, director of Save It Like Sully. And if you're an executive who wants to own the room uh, from a presentation standpoint, well, he's the guy you want to connect with. His website, www.saveitlikesully.com. And uh, I'm just fortunate and grateful to have the chance to spend some time with him because obviously, as you see, he's a very busy guy. Uh, they say a rolling stone gathers no moss. So, uh, big thank you to Anil. We're going to have Rob Notman from Optimum Talent joining me on Friday at 12 noon, talking about transitions, career transitions, and just talking about, uh, again, the new normal. I guess that's always good. Uh, all roads kind of lead to that subject matter, the new normal that we're experiencing and how we navigate those waters. So I'm excited about that. But Anil Delari, without a doubt, hit a home run. And you know, uh, keep listening out for his son to in his podcast because that kid's going to be something special. Uh, Thanks, guys. Kid. Anil Delari, cheers. Take care, brother. And a shout out to Chris Corvo, who's in upstate New York, uh, right near Dick Eye Pontiac, in Tonawanda, New York, <laughs> and House of Guitars. Chris Corvo, get some aloe on. You got a sunburn. Much love to you in New York State. And uh, I will talk to everybody real soon. Stay safe and stay well. Take care. Thank you.